What is going on, everyone? James Hancock here, back to review episode six of Star Trek Discovery. And this is the kind of episode that's really tough to review because it was a bit of a mixed bag. It had a lot of stuff in there that I thoroughly enjoyed and some other details that I enjoyed less so, but I'll be getting to all of that as I get into my recap. But the big question going into this episode for most people is whether or not we would learn anything new that would either confirm or deny the widely held suspicion that the actor Shazad Latif is playing both Ash Tyler as well as Vok. I'm not entirely sure whether or not CBS made a lot of mistakes in terms of their IMBD listings and which episode Shahzad Latif was listed on, or if this is all an elaborate smokescreen to throw us off what is going on with the character of Vok. But for people who don't know what I'm talking about, the idea is that Vok basically volunteered at the end of episode four to be turned into a human in order to infiltrate Starfleet. And there is some historical precedent of Klingons being altered to look human or look or looking vaguely human. I mean, in the original series, a lot of the Klingons did look basically human, but Tribbles were able to detect them. So everybody's wondering whether or not the Tribble that is in Lorca's office is gonna sniff them out. And a lot of people suspect that over the course of this season that Klingons will be mutated or changed in a way, or at least one tribe might be, in order to resemble the Klingons we see in the original series in order to make things match. Basically, they're jumping through a lot of hoops to try to make all the continuity matched up because starting with Star Trek The Motion Picture, Klingons had a massive overhaul in their appearance, which they retroactively have tried to explain a variety of ways. But as far as the character of Ash Tyler and Vok are concerned, I'm not 100% sold. It seems like the consensus is it's 100%. But as we see over the course of this episode, Ash Tyler's really good at behaving like a human if he is, in fact, not human. I'm actually leaning toward taking the minority view that it is not, in fact, Vok, that perhaps it might even be Lorca that got swapped out while he was on the Klingon ship. But I have to really think that one through before I make too much of a commitment to it because I haven't really digested all the little details to see if my theory has any validity. In any case, this episode is all about a giant rescue attempt to save Sarek, who's at the heart of this nebula cloud, because a Vulcan extremist has basically used himself as a human weapon in order to try to destroy him. There's a small extremist faction of Vulcans who cherish logic above all else, and they don't like the presence of humans, and they want to have Vulcan remove itself from the Federation, and so they feel like taking out Sarek would be a step in that direction. And Michael Burnham, through her, basically her telepathic link, or what they describe as Contra, is able to detect that he's in trouble, and she needs to go and save him. Over the course of her mission, we learn a hell of a lot about her relationship with Sarek. We also learn a little secret, but there's a lot in here that I feel like a lot of people are potentially could get annoyed by because to an extent, I feel like it betrays what we know about Vulcans in the sense that Sarek is portrayed as being borderline dishonest, and I've always operated under the assumption that Vulcans are incapable of lying. Spock is famous for saying, I'm a Vulcan, I'm incapable of lying. But of course, they are capable of exaggeration. But also, I'm just not 100% on board the way a lot of these actors are portraying Vulcans. Perhaps it is unfair of me to hold the actors playing Vulcans to such a high standard, but when Leonard Nimoy casts such a long shadow, I feel like it's inevitable because Leonard Nimoy had this unique blend of irony and humor and logic. And I feel like a lot of actors make the mistake of assuming that because they're Vulcan, they just have to be cold and they have to be distant and robotic. And that's not what Vulcans are all about. Even Mark Leonard as Sarek in the original series had a lot more nuance to his interpretation of how Vulcans behave. In any case, I'm kind of putting the cart in front of the horse. So let's get into the recap and we can tackle all these issues one at a time. The episode features some interesting stuff just about life on the Discovery. We see Sylvia Tilly and Michael Burnham jogging and they make a reference to the Enterprise at one point, which is pretty cool. Sylvia Tilly's basically wondering what she needs to do in order to carve a path from cadet to captain. And Michael Burnham's trying to give her some advice, whether it's through calisthenics or martial arts or being really good at her job, etc. Sylvia Tilly remains a character that I'm not super enthusiastic about and this episode did not change my opinion, but I don't want to be too negative, so I'm not going to dwell on all the issues that I have with Sylvia Tilly. I just hope at some point her character will evolve in a way that suddenly I become her biggest fan. But for now, that has not yet happened. We also see an interesting holographic drill where Lorca and Tyler are teaming up, taking on a bunch of Klingons, and Ash is basically a total badass in combat. And Lorca invites him to be his new chief of security, which is interesting. And it's one of those things where Lorca's done an extensive background check, and they even talk about Tyler and where he lived and its proximity to Seattle. 
And it seems like Lorca's done everything in his power to f figure out whether or not Tyler is someone who can be trusted. So if Tyler is in fact Vok, once again, I don't 100% by that theory, but if he is Vok in disguise, the Klingons have done an admirable job of making him seem as convincing as humanly possible. But the plot thickens when Michael starts to detect essentially that Sarek is in trouble. Sarek is on a diplomatic mission to meet with the Klingons to try to broker some sort of peace to stop this horrible war. And I know some people really dislike the idea that Sarek is displaying this ability to have this power where his soul and Michael's soul are basically permanently merged, allowing them to speak telepathically across the entire universe. I'm not enough of a science purist, at least in terms of the science of Star Trek, to make too much of a um, of an issue of it, but I totally understand why some people just don't want to buy it. In any case, for the purposes of this episode, we just have to accept that Michael Burnham and Sarah can basically communicate telepathically wherever they are in the universe, as far-fetched as that might sound. But it's a weird thing where he keeps ejecting her from his mind because he's trying to conceal something, and so that usually manifests itself in the form of hand-to-hand -hand combat. For me, my personal favorite Vulcan hand-to-hand -hand combat has to still be Kirk versus Spock, way back in the original series, swinging big plastic toys at each other. But with the help of engineering, Michael Burnham basically cooks up this device that's going to act as a booster to her connection to Sarek and hopefully shock him awake so they can figure out exactly where he is because the Discovery can't go into the nebula because their spore technology would explode in contact with the gases found in that particular nebula. So it's basically Sylvia Tilly, Ash Tyler as pilot, and Michael Burnham. And there's a nice little moment where Lorca tells Ash Tyler, bring her back or don't come back at all. I mean, obviously Lorca is starting to value Michael Burnham quite highly. We also have an interesting subplot where Admiral Cornwell comes aboard the Discovery Discovery to assess to what degree Lorca is fit to remain in command of the Discovery. After all, he only finished being tortured about a week prior, and Lorca pours her a glass of single malt and puts the moves on her. They obviously have a lot of history, and they end up getting it on. And there's an interesting bit where when he's sleeping, she sees these scars on his back, one of which is like in a triangle shape, and as she's touching it, he pulls a phaser on her, and at that point she decides that his psyche is too out of whack or too unbalanced to remain in command, Lorca pleads with her to let him stay in his current position fighting the war, but she seems unconvinced. But back in the nebula, as it turns out, the big secret that Sarek has been hiding, when Michael Burnham was applying to the Vulcan Expeditionary Group, she always thought that she'd get accepted because of her failings as a human. Even though her test scores were superb, she always felt like it was her fault and that she basically had disappointed Sarek or let him down. But she learns that Sarek actually has been hiding something from her for a very long time. He was basically told by the Vulcan Expeditionary Group we're not that keen on having too much human infiltration into our organization, so you have to choose. Either your half Vulcan, half human son Spock can apply one day, or you can have Michael Burnham apply, but we only have room for one of your human experiments. And Sarek basically lied to Michael Burnham at the time, saying that she had been turned down. And I guess maybe my question is to people out there, because we've seen Vulcans be dishonest in the sense that one of the villains in Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, was a Vulcan. So obviously they're capable of deception. But I was always under the impression that Vulcans deem dishonesty as essentially being illogical. So why would he hide it from her? Why wouldn't he just give her the cold, brunt truth at that time? But I will leave that to the hardcore Star Trek purists to decide. But I'm leaning toward their distorting a little bit about what makes Vulcans Vulcans in the first place. When they get him back on the Discovery, they realize that his injuries are too extensive for him to go meet with the Klingons. So Lorca decides to send Admiral Cornwell instead. At the same time, he offers Michael Burnham a permanent position on the bridge as a science specialist, which is an interesting step up from her kind of unknown, untenable position that she's been in up to this point. She's grateful and immediately accepts, and she confronts Sarek over their strange, strained relationship and his attempts to keep her at a distance, and she basically says that they're going to have to have a clarification session at some point, but as she walks away, she does refer to him as father. And the episode starts to draw to a close with a nice little bonding scene between Ash Tyler and Michael Burnham about what it means to be human. Once again, I did not see any clues or evidence to suggest that Ash Tyler is in fact 
Spock. But who knows? I very well might turn out to be wrong in the next few episodes. But before Admiral Cornwell departs, she does tell Lorca that she is going to strip him of his command when she gets back from the meeting with the Klingons. It's kind of interesting that she wouldn't decide to just go ahead and do that before leaving. I was thinking that Lorca might be so hell-bent upon keeping his position that he would actually sabotage her mission, but he doesn't need to because General Call of the Klingons betrays Cornwell has all of her aides killed then and there, and takes her captive. We do get a great little humorous bit where Saru goes to see Lorca and asks for orders, and he basically says, report this to Starfleet and we'll await their commands. And Saru's like, wait a second, but I'm so used to you kind of flying by the seat of your pants and making up your own rules, that's pretty unconventional. But Lorca, because obviously it works to his advantage, decides to play this one by the book, at least for the time being. In any case, in the teaser, we see that Harry Mudd is gonna be in the next episode. We also see that it deals with a strange time loop scenario a 30-minute loop that keeps repeating itself, reminding me quite a bit of this classic episode from The Next Generation called Cause and Effect, which is one of my favorite episodes that I've ever seen. My hope is that it's basically not a thinly veiled remake of that episode, that they find a way to put their own individual stamp on it, but who knows? If you're going to steal, at least steal from the best. In any case, I thought this was a pretty solid episode, probably not an exceptional one, but I still had fun watching it. It'll be interesting to see what this show builds to leading up to its mid-season break. I think we only have two more episodes before the mid-season break, and we don't really have any clear idea of what this season really is building to yet, but who knows? We will find out in the very near future. As always, I really appreciate people watching my videos. Please consider giving my channel a subscribe. Also, if you want to hunt down a Star Trek shirt like this one that I'm wearing now, I recently joined an affiliate program with tblocks.com, and if you use the coupon code GEEKINTBX, it'll actually give you a 10% discount on any purchases that you make on that site, and I'll include a link to that in the show notes below. And I'll be back later this week to talk some Orville. I'll definitely be reviewing Stranger Things Season 2. I'm very fired up for that. But as always, thank you so much for watching. I'll talk to y'all soon.